pass on to the third speaker, Mr. Joseph Watkins. Thank you, Sam. Can you hear me at the back? Yeah, yeah. You sure? Okay. Thank you. Uh, PowerPoint. Yeah. Well, good evening all. Um, unlike the two previous speakers, my experience personally in Syria has been pretty unpleasant. Um, as a child in the 80s, I remember marching in the streets yelling, Syria out of Lebanon. So um, it hasn't been a very pleasant experience. Um, in 1988, during the war and the uh, Syrian occupation, um, I was actually there at the time when I actually met my wife. Um, Australia had closed its embassy in Beirut and people in Lebanon were forced to travel to the nearest Australian embassy, which was in Damascus. While travelling to the embassy in Damascus, my cousins quickly warned me never to comment on the Syrian government because the Mukhabarat, the secret Syrian intelligence, were everywhere. They would nudge me in the back seat of a taxi, not to say a word. In 2006, my family was on summer holidays in Lebanon and were caught in the Israeli Hezbollah crossfire when roads and airports were bombed. We escaped to Syria because my children were afraid of being bombed by ship en route to Cyprus. At Damascus airport, a security guard asked me to open my wallet and he helped himself to my money. As someone with the same name as me was on their most wanted list, I was then interrogated behind closed doors by the security staff for 30 minutes while my children were petrified and the plane was still waiting. When the staff realised that I was not the person they were looking for, there was no apology, no explanation. It was just, Ruhula, which means, get out of here. So my personal experience in Syria has been horrible. With all my experiences inside Syria being so unpleasant, I've got no reason to be an apologist for the Assads. But I resist allowing my personal experiences to overshadow my quest for the bigger truth, even if it's uncomfortable and inconvenient. I'm less interested in defending Syria, more interested in defending the truth. The authoritarian regime has been compared with the Ministry of Truth in George Orwell's 1984, where Big Brother is represented by the Syrian Mukhabarat. The Syrian regime has a profound distrust of Western media and no real expertise in public relations to justify itself to outsiders. In fact, it's a self-sufficient economy which believes that it does not even need to justify itself to outsiders. As Syria is governed by a socialist Ba'ath party, it's similar to Russia and China in its tradition of rare public statements. Mother Agnes Marion, who will be coming to Australia shortly, has been in St James Catholic Monastery in Homs for 18 years, and she suggested that media access was denied in Syria partly because in Libya, journalists secretly hid electronic devices for NATO military intelligence. Now, the Syrian government's restrictions on professional Western media inside Syria, I think, has actually backfired. It's created a vacuum that's been filled by anonymous, amateur voices and self-appointed monitors. Their traffic of tweets and mobile phone images have, proved, have provided feeds to a very hungry media who has followed them without checks and balances. Tweets can claim to be eyewitnesses on the ground in Syria reporting facts, yet being a foreign <coughs> country creating fiction and indeed friction. Even our Australian media resort to copycat behaviour and take their editorial cues from American foreign policy, which defines who is villain and who is victim. On 16th of May last year, Media Watch on ABC TV exposed a falsified report of Syrian troops beating detained protesters. It was later proven to be in Lebanon three years prior. Australian media swam with the strong current and Australians bought the simplistic story that was sold every time there was a massacre in Syria. They believed the unnamed sources who quickly blamed the government. Ironically, 
any journalist who has bothered to read the Syrian National Council's Charter of Demands, and they're up there on the screen now, they're in English and they're available to you any time, would discover that they closely match the reform agenda already being implemented by the Syrian president. For example, the SNC demands include abolishing emergency law. It's happened. Licensing new political parties. That's happened. Licensing of new media outlets. The same. Specific terms governing the election of the president and a peaceful transition to the free democratic rule. Now, why didn't Australian journalists pick up that what the president was doing has already been on their list? When the Syrian president opened the door to unarmed dialogue, the SNC could have safely put those cards on the table in the presence of the UN peace monitors safely. Instead, they squandered that opportunity and their response was name calling. We will never sit and talk with Butcher Bashar, the murderous regime, the illegitimate occupying militia, quotes from the SNC. With such violent rhetoric, it's no wonder that they have struggled to gain legitimacy among the disparate opposition voices. Rather than a diplomatic solution, the SNC sought every opportunity to trigger a Libya-style military solution, NATO intervention and a no-fly zone by incriminating the government. Had neighbouring Israel been under attack from foreign-funded forces, not only would it call them terrorists, but the US would insist that Israel had a moral duty to protect its sovereign borders and territorial integrity from invasion. Now I've heard today, just in the last couple of hours, at least three people say to me, the riots that we saw here in Sydney on Saturday resemble the sort of rebel terrorist activities that are happening in Syria. Now Australia's reaction to the people we saw on Saturday was ruthless. They have no place here, they should be deported, this is an invasion, etc, etc. Why the double standard when, when you have people within Syria saying similar thugs are operating in our homeland, why is that supposed to be condoned? US spokespersons have condemned the permanent United Nations Security Council members, Russia and China, for abusing their power of veto three times to block military solutions against Syria. But this smacks of hypocrisy and forgets the log in America's own eye. Have we forgotten that the US lobbied vigorously against Palestinian statehood when it vetoed the UNSC vote, thus perpetuating suffering and subordination? This disconnect between the truth and the propaganda begs some questions for anyone brave enough to swim against the current. The question, what is truth, becomes both practical and moral in the face of horrific images that compel outrage and action. US Secretary of State Hillary Clinton pounces on cue to mobilise moral outrage and she contrasts the US from Russia and China. The international community cannot sit by and we won't, she said. We dismiss Russian, Chinese, Iranian and Syrian news services as unreliable pro-Syrian propaganda. It becomes tempting to throw our hands to the air in despair and say, if the UN monitors have given up, they've walked out, and the armed opposition groups are gaining ground, and regime change is inevitable, please get us out of our misery, cut our human losses, and get the regime change over with. But do we also cut out the truth? The Arab Spring may have given rise to jasmines in Tunisia, but parasitic weeds may take root and seeds may fall from foreign gardens. When the Arab Spring becomes a dense canopy, many shady truths hide underneath the bushy foliage. If we prune that foliage of the Arab Spring, we may expose those lurking parasites. My first foray into, Australian, into the Syrian situation in the Australian media was August last year, when the opinion editor of the Age newspaper phoned me asking for a piece to explain the Syrian crisis. As a regular columnist on Middle East issues, I gave my opinion. I cautioned that Syria is not Libya, as the president enjoys massive popularity by his own citizens. I highlighted the pivotal role of Syria in the region and that foreign intervention is dangerous because of this domino effect. I argued that there was a third way, other than the status quo and other than a bloody revolution, which is evolution. 
by pressing for accountability and timelines for the implementation of the President's reform package. I argued that the peaceful protesters seeking a democracy would be hijacked by Saudi Salafis seeking their radical version of Sunni theocracy. I argued that there was a serious disconnect between eyewitnesses in Syria and the media narrative of dictator-crushing dissent among his own people. The editor responded that my piece was too sanguine about Assad in the light of the international condemnation. He had to swim with the school of fish, with the current. This is the article that eventually appeared. After many edits and rewrites, this piece was finally published in the age on 18th of August. It was titled Sweet Victory Without the War because I posed a rhetorical Arabic question to the armed opposition. Do you want to eat the grapes or do you want to kill the vineyard's guard? Are you bloodthirsty for the president's scalp or do you really want to taste the fruits of new policies in a new Syria? From there, I was invited many times to comment on the Syrian situation on ABC TV's The Drum uh, and, and News 24, always expressing caution about the disparate opposition voices. By the 2nd of April 2012, the Australian-Israel Jewish Affairs Council referred to me as a noted Jewish apologist, what do they call me? A noted, um, a noted Assad apologist, I love that name, noted Assad apologist. Thank you. This simplistic logic was reminiscent of the George W. Bush dictum when he declared the war on terror in 2001. Either you're with us or you're with the terrorists. This polarizing ultimatum forces us to either become allies or deem the enemy. A similar ultimatum now applies in Syria. If you criticize Assad's enemies, then you must be Assad's ally, supporting a terrorist regime in the axis of evil. The intention of the Assad apologist label is to silence debate and stifle questioning. Well, that hasn't happened. The more I pruned the dense foliage of the Arab Spring, the more I discovered an intricate array of pipelines feeding Syria through its neighboring countries. Pipelines of American money funneled through the SNC, Saudi weapons smuggled through the Free Syrian Army, mercenaries from Libya, Turkey, Jordan, Yemen, Tunis, Afghanistan, Chechnya, Iraq, Algeria, Australia. funneled through, sorry? From Australia as well. From Australia as well. Yes. Thank you for the reminder. <laughs> uh, funneled through to the Salafists. This was condemned when Robert, this was, sorry, confirmed when Robert Fisk interviewed the rebels in Syrian prisons as published in The Independent on the 2nd of September. <laughs> It was no surprise that the UN Arab League Joint Special Envoy Kofi Annan resigned from the post in August. There was hope. He must have been tempted to overturn the negotiation table and expose these pipelines. Above the table, the key stakeholder nations talk about a political solution. But under the table, they sabotage the peace plan with this lucrative supply chain of arms. It's ironic that Annan's replacement, Algerian diplomat, Laka Brahimi represents the Arab League who have suspended Syria. They're not supposed to be talking. The oil rich states of Saudi Arabia is fueling a sectarian confrontation, wishing to promote another Sunni state and emasculate the secular Syria that was allied with Shiite Iran. Fellow Sunni state Qatar flexed its muscle for the same pro Sunni bias through its global Al Jazeera news network. These countries committed over $100 million of weapons and cash after the SNC kept reminding them that that's what they were promised. Only when we ask the right questions will we find the truth about the heart of the matter. If the oil-rich chieftains are prepared to support a jihadist war because they genuinely care about Arab people, why do they choose the suffering Syrians over the suffering Palestinians? Why did they target a fellow Arab country rather than a country which many refuse to even name on their map? If they genuinely care about Arab dignity and freedom, why did most of these Arab states remain silent when Gaza was reduced to a human abattoir in December 2008, when 1,300 Gazans were killed during Operation Cast Lead in a week? When the Syrian government announced an eight-day amnesty to hand in weapons last November to Mar'id al-Adha, 
Why did the US government advise the rebels to never lay down their weapons when it could have told them to sit and try and negotiate a political solution? In the month after the April 10 ceasefire, why is it that most of the attacks were against the Syrian army, not by the Syrian army? Why has the US failed to condemn or distance itself from its arch enemy, Al-Qaeda, which is now an American ally? Is it amoral as the enemy of my enemy is my friend? Why are ostensibly Christian countries like US, France and Britain siding with the jihadists and ignoring the public pleas from their endangered fellow Christians and church leaders within Syria? All these double standards do not add up to a genuine concern over Syrian citizens. But they do raise questions about a grand plan or promise to the rebels that if they do all the dirty groundwork, demonize Assad and decline every opportunity to talk, the rewards in the new regime will be great. There is one pivotal question that must be asked of all those screaming for Assad to simply hand over the power. If there was a UN monitored <coughs> election in Syria, and eligible citizens re-elected the same president, would the rebels and their sponsors pack up and go home? Imagine if the UN supervision mission in Syria returned to monitor a national referendum on the Syrian presidency that would be free from fear or favour. If Assad fails to regain <clears throat> the majority of votes from the citizens, he should honour the will of the citizens, step down, face the consequences under national and international laws. But if he gains the majority of votes, the SNC must honour the will of the Syrian people. The Free Syrian Army would need to disarm and disband. The remaining Salafists, terrorists, suicide bombers and mercenaries would need to return to sender. Most importantly, their international sponsors would have to immediately cut supply to their rebel militia. No one could seriously argue with this fair proposal, could they? Yes, we can, said America. And it would go along these lines. This is how I imagine it would go. The American president would say, we cannot accept, I'm not going to put on the accent, we cannot accept the outcome of the UN monitored presidential election because those in exile or refugee camps in neighbouring countries could not vote. The Syrian people have lived in fear under a dictatorship for over 40 years when voting against their president was suicidal. Therefore, we have no choice but to impose more economic sanctions against Syria. While the US rhetoric is ostensibly interested in democracy and peace, their unspoken agenda has nothing to do with Syria and everything to do with two other countries which were prominent in the news before the Syrian uprising but have since disappeared off the radar. Who are they? Iran and Israel. As former US Assistant Secretary of State James Rubin stated in the US-led alliance against Syria is about targeting Iran to protect Israel. Damascus is merely the bridge to bomb between Tehran and Tel Aviv. Toppling Assad would mean that, quote, Iran would no longer have, have a Mediterranean foothold from which to threaten Israel. This was confirmed when Israel's own defense minister, Ehud Barak, declared that Syria is, quote, the only kind of outpost of the Iranian influence in the Arab world, and it will weaken dramatically both Hezbollah in Lebanon and Hamas and Islamic Jihad in Gaza. Yes, this international proxy war against Syria has been sold to us as a civil war among Syrians. It is like a game of chess, where the king needs to be cornered and converted into a pawn. We saw this in the 80s when our man, Osama bin Laden, helped the Mujahideen in Afghanistan fend off the Russian invasion. He was crowned king by the US in that context. Syria was very thirsty for an Arab Spring, as it suffered a drought without rainfall since 2006, likely to have been caused by climate change. According to UN figures, herders lost 80% of their livestock, about 3 million Syrians ended up in poverty, and small-scale farmers could not cultivate food to feed their own families. Syria was so dry, it was highly flammable, physically and politically. I'm not going to go into how the whole revolution started in Syria. I think it's been covered by others. I'm not even going to go into what all the Salafists and uh, the Saudi sheikhs have been saying, what to do and who to kill. Um, I'll probably go if we've got two minutes to go. This is something that's happened locally in Australia. Some of you would be aware that the 
the uh, conflict overseas and the violence that spills over into Australia. Um, and this is the confirmation that I've never really believed that the Arab Spring simplistic model applies in Syria. So what I'll do, I'll just read through the last page, it'll take me through about 60 seconds, I think. The jihadist calls echo in Australia as their followers have sought to terrorise Australians, uh, other ways in particular with petrol bombs, vilifying graffiti and death threats. It is now the other ways in Australia who are anxious about Muqabir up in the opposition, monitoring their movements and threatening their relatives in Syria. Ironically, the more the Salafis terrorise Syria, the more Syrians cling to Bashar al-Assad as their saviour, preferring a secular sanctuary over a jihadist theocracy. Now this feeds directly into the Salafist claim that these heretical Alawites worship Assad above Allah. Assad is no sacrificial lamb or messiah being crucified by false witnesses. When he enjoyed standing ovations in his parliament, he squandered his historic opportunity to snuff out the embers before they became infernos. But there is a more moral way to right the wrongs, besides bribing defectors with gold coins, playing with the truth and living by the sword. In Australia, our media was dragged screaming away from the neat narrative of the Arab Spring and forced to open its eyes and ears to the faces and voices of those who seek a non-violent third way, where the door is open to the real friends of Syria, those who lay down their weapons and treat Syrians as people not as pawns on a chess set. The truth, like Saudi oil, will rise to the surface. Thank you. Thank you, Joseph. Now call our final speaker, uh, Susan Bergen. And if you can store up your questions, after Susan, we'll, we'll come back to questions.